Hi all, welcome uh, to the CAE seminar on Friday, March 8th. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our speaker, Professor Edward M. Sagal from uh, Australia University, where he's an associate professor. Uh, he's going to talk about building in unconventional ways with novel design to fabrication methods. So uh, Dr. Segal is an associate professor in the Department of Engineering at Hofstra University. He's also an adjunct faculty in the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. He leads the Segal Structures Group, which engages in material exploration, form generation, historic analysis, related to a range of engineering, uh, research, design, and teaching activities. He received the SOM Foundation Structural Engineering Travel Fellowship in 2008, the XC Teaching Award from ASCE in 2017, among many other awards. Uh, so, uh, without any further introduction, thank you very much, Professor Segal, for doing this, and it's all yours. Great, uh, Pranoy. Thanks so much for the introduction, and thank you, and uh, Landoff, for inviting me here to, to speak to you today. So, I just want to highlight right from the start that all the experimental projects we're going to discuss are collaborations. So, the, these projects are only possible because I work with architects and artists, fellow engineers, and, and students, and I'm really excited to, to share these stories with you. So in late 2016, my colleague, Josh Draper, did what millions of Americans do every year in late November. He went out Black Friday shopping. And he went out and he purchased a propane torch and he waited patiently for this electric furnace to arrive from Amazon. And then later that Thanksgiving weekend, he pulled a pan out and baked some wet clay, allowed it to dry and crack, and then he melted aluminum cans down in the furnace, poured them into the cracked clay, and then used that propane port, uh, torch to help that aluminum flow through the, the cracks. At the time, we were one of the finalists in the 2017 City of Dreams Pavilion competition. And at this point, we were working madly just to create a prototype a few days ahead of the, the deadline. This competition is held annually or had been held annually in, in New York City for a number of years. And it's focused on sustainability and this idea of what sustainability means for those in the New York City area. And so our concept, which is shown here in this rendering, was to take clay, allow it to crack and serve as formwork for casting recycled aluminum cans at a large scale. And the idea is that after we cast these panels, we're going to take the panels and propagate them to create the structures that you see at the right. And then to demonstrate the method used to create the structures on site, we're gonna have these pools of clay that over the course of the installation will go through cycles. They'll wet, they'll dry, as they'll dry, they'll crack. And then, you know, one of the big ideas that everyone's trying to um, look into these days is this idea of a circular economy is afterward, how do we take these components that are only part of the structure for a few months and then find other lives for them. Here's a rendering that we submitted at the, the final stage and you get a sense of the, the location. So this is on part of New York City called Governor's Island, which is an island just south of the main part of Manhattan. And in the background, you can see one World Trade Center. So as part of the competition submission, we submitted renderings, but we'd studied past winners and knew that to have a good shot at, at really selling our idea, we had to have something physical. We had to have a prototype. At the same time, we realized that if we submitted a prototype involving metal and one of the jurors cut themselves, then we totally wouldn't win. So we took that piece that Josh had made after Thanksgiving and I brought it back to, to Hofstra and I had students work on this small scale prototype with tools to try to take off the sharp edges and they made a little bit of progress. Now, we submitted this prototype with the renderings and the rest of our proposal. And we were supposed to hear back in December of 2016, heard nothing, everyone got super busy with other projects. And then in early January, 2017, we received word that we won the competition. And now we had to start scrambling because we had until June. So we had about five months to complete this project. And at this point, this prototype is the largest thing we've cast. It's basically the size of like a network router. And for the final project, each of these panels had to be about nine feet tall, so nearly three meters tall by a foot and a half wide, so about a half a meter, meter wide. So we had to scale up quite a lot and figure out how we're gonna do what we had done at a small scale at a large scale in, in five months. So we did a lot more prototyping. 
we needed to figure out how we could get a reasonable crack pattern in the, the clay. So I had a student here, uh, Saida Manzor. She was a junior undergraduate student working with me. And she was looking at things like different water contents for the clay and how do we fill the trays and how do we dry them to get the crack pattern we want. And so let's take a quick look at this time-lapse video of one of the tests. This is a, an approach where she's using kind of a very low water content and trying to press the clay into the tray. The idea there was it would be really helpful to have kind of consistent thickness, but the, the issue was this took a lot of time to fill the trays with the clay. And then also the, the cracks weren't wide enough really once we cast the, clay, the aluminum into the cracks to actually form competent structure. So this was kind of a back and forth that we were going going with in terms of looking at different variables. So eventually what we settled on was like a really wet clay mix, essentially a slurry that we could rapidly pour into the trays. And then when they would crack, the cracks would be larger, allowing more aluminum to flow and having more structure. And then to speed up this whole process, we used fans to kind of push away the moist air as moisture came out of the, the clay during the drying process. We also needed to collect a lot of cans. So at the top left, you can see my old old car filled with lots of beverage cans. My students would very gratefully uh, leave their cans that they had after the weekend outside my door, and then I would lug them around in my, my car. The right, you can see us trying to, to melt some of these down. We also teamed up with a nonprofit called Sure We Can, uh, which supports canners in the Brooklyn area. And we also have this uh, large donation from Sims Municipal Recycling Company. They're the large recycling company in the New York City area. And they donated these bales of aluminum. Each one weighed basically a ton. And we had to break these apart using pickaxes, which is as much fun as you think it would be. So it was, it was good. So we pulled these apart and then we had to uh, melt these down and we created this large scale smelter, but we were in completely over our heads. This is like a, you know, an established process for smelting down recycled aluminum. So, you know, this is part of what happens with these competition ideas. You have this idea that sounds really appealing, but the execution, especially when you're trying to intercept waste and transform it is really complicated. And so we did smelt down our own aluminum and we had some of that go into the project, but ultimately we had to also use recycled aluminum, what's called ingot blocks of aluminum, uh, in addition to what we smelted down on our on our own. And then at the end of the project, um, a good chunk of the aluminum that we had collected, we then recycled again. Some of it, I believe one of the artists kind of kept for potential future, future projects. Now we're in March. So we're three months out and we're preparing for kind of our first larger scale prototype. And at this point we've teamed up with two artists, Scott Thompson and Bruce Lindsay, and they were key to this because they both have decades of casting experience. And we were able to work out of Scott's studio at a sculpture park in New Jersey. And so at the left, you can see Scott and Bruce, and they're pulling a crucible of aluminum out of this furnace. And then at the right here, you can see the two of them coming over to this mold. And so within here, you have cracked clay, and they're going to pour the molds in aluminum into the mold, and you're going to start to see steam coming out. There you go. And now oh, we have a leak. So, it, um, and there's this fire. I've never seen a casting before, nothing, especially at this scale. And, but these two guys are not flinching. They're, they've seen everything and they're just going along until the, the first prototype is, is done. At the left, you can see Scott pulling back the top part of the form. And then at the bottom right, you can see in the center, the aluminum component that had been formed. At the right is the wood, which was the bottom of the form board. And then here was the top. And so these actually all serve as kind of nice artifacts trying to demonstrate the, the process. And so we, we put that first piece, which had some flaws, right? We had a issue with the, the mold if we're losing aluminum through the, the bottom, but this was sufficient at the time to show proof of concept. And we went ahead and put this up on Kickstarter and we actually crowdsourced the funding for most of this project. So we, we were lucky to get funding and now we're full speed ahead. So now we're April, two months out. And at the top left, you can see our approach to making this, this slurry. So we use this local clay from New Jersey, we're mixing it with water at the top right. We are pouring that clay into these wooden trays. At the bottom left, you can see the fans that we're using to try to push away the moist air as it comes out of, as the moisture escapes from the clay through the top. And then at the bottom right, you can see these long lengths of cracked clay that we're gonna then use as the forms. 
Here at the top left is one of the three steel trays. We only had enough funding for three steel trays. These are what we're going to eventually cast the aluminum into. And so this got a little bit tricky. So ideally what we could have done was we would have dried the clay directly in the steel trays, but we were running out of time. And so we couldn't, we couldn't do that. What we had to do was we had to dry clay in a different area, kind of at a larger scale, a number of different panels of clay. And then we transferred them into the steel trays and there's some sheetrock at the bottom here. And it became this large puzzle that we were doing. So we slightly distorted the crack pattern, but we had to do this in order to make the, the project happen in the timeline that we, we had. At the bottom left, you can see one of these trays kind of loaded, loaded up. And at the bottom right now, you can see us casting aluminum into the, oh. into the tray. Yeah, that's super random. This is like a huge like garden in okay. here. I've never been though. I kind of wanted to go, but. Okay, so then if we go yeah. to the next slide cool. here, we've got um, at the top left, you can see that the top of the mold and you can see it, there's these kind of splash patterns of aluminum across the top. So part of what happens is even when you're trying to dry the clay, there's still some water trapped in there. And so the, the water as it's trying to escape, when it hits the aluminum, um, it forms steam and the steam actually pushes some of the aluminum back out through these ceramic chimneys. So it's a little bit of a, call it kind of an explosive process. It's not like there's an explosion, but it's a little bit more um, messy than it would be if we were using other kinds of materials like resin bonded sand, which you usually use when you perform castings. At the, the center here, you can see the clay still embedded within the aluminum. So after we pulled the panels out, we would have to remove the clay and then we would power wash it out. And you can see three of the panels at the right here. And to give you a sense of scale, you can see they're much taller than Josh here, who's about you know six foot one, six foot six foot two. Just like with the small scale prototype, we had to do a little bit of post processing. So at the top left, you can see Lisa Ramsberg, who served as kind of the project manager on the project, using a plasma cutter. So what would happen in some cases is the aluminum would get trapped below the clay and form what's called flashing. It would essentially fill in the opening. And so between Lisa and myself, we probably spent about 24 hours hunched over using this plasma cutter to take out those uh, flashing, take out the flashing to open the spots back, back up. We also have to do a little bit of chamfering and other grinding to take off sharp, sharp edges. So we had kind of a whole army of volunteers come down from the New York City area to New Jersey to help us over the course of a few, few weekends. Pulled one last all-nighter, loaded this thing in a truck, and drove it up to New York City. We then had to take it on a ferry across to the island. And the final installation on the island, we completed in under 36 hours. So a lot of this was this, you know, prefabricating everything in the shop, bringing it to the site, and then installing in a mad, mad dash. We worked right up until opening. And here's the realized structure. So you can see that the site on Governor's Island is a little bit different than the one that I showed in the initial rendering. They moved us to the northern part of the island, but you can still still see One World Trade Center in the background. Also, you know, due to time and budget constraints, we were only able to fabricate and install one rather than two structures. But we felt that if we could at least get the one built, it was still showing the process that we'd hope to hope to do. Also, we had hoped that we can make the aluminum work structurally. But at the end, after seeing some of the defects that were happening during casting, we felt more comfortable supporting the, the aluminum panels with steel components. So if you look closely, you can see along the edges of the aluminum, we have this steel frame that was built to support it. And this was a conversation we had with the architects that was ongoing. We basically said, look, we're gonna try our best to make the aluminum work structurally, but the reality is this is an experimental project and you know we're going to have to put this in to the public um, and there's liability concerns. So ultimately we decided we would support it with this steel structure. The structure was up for a couple months in the summer into the fall and it did what we'd hoped. You know, we, we had these cycles where it would go through wet drying and cracking. And here you can see Lisa at the structure and you kind of see it in the process of going through these phases. We had done all that prototyping indoors. So to actually see this wet, dry, and crack outside was really beautiful. We also had a lot of new variables. You can see these dimples in the surface of the clay. And so what would happen is that when the clay was uh, going from a wet state to a dry state, essentially a plastic state, 
you would have the rain hit it and then these dimples would form from the rain and you have these leaf prints and we found out that raccoons live on uh, governor's island and people would write messages in the clay so it became this really this way of almost documenting what was happening on the site and then it would rain it would re-wet it would dry and crack and then you'd have a new new pattern this is a photo taken that also represents kind of the vandal load case or essentially a person on top of the the pavilion uh, this is a pretty common case that we have to consider when we're working on pavilions and, and installations. You know, you design things for people not to climb on them, but at the same time, someone's going to climb on it and you have to make sure it's it's safe. Here, um, what I really like about this image is you can see the clay cracked juxtaposed with the aluminum. Also, my, my colleague Alex Chang, who at the time was working at Schleich Bergemann and now works for Knippers Helbig, she did the structural design. I, I did the checks on it. Uh, but she did a really nice job with that steel frame. She kind of set it back from the aluminum panels and you end up getting this nice reveal. So I thought that was a nice way to basically make the structural steel present, but at the same time, allow it to accentuate the, the aluminum. After the pavilion was taken down, we were able to turn some of the panels into furniture. So you can see a stool and a bench. We turned a couple panels into an arbor. We also, sold some of the panels to people to put in their residences. It basically, you know, helped fund the project. We had a few that appeared in another art uh, installation as well. So we were able to, at least to some extent, allow the aluminum to live on in new forms, maybe less successfully finding second homes for the other, other components. So with the cast in place project, we utilize that natural process of clay cracking. So part of my work and the work that I do with my team explores other kinds of transformations. And so one of the questions that really drives this work is what other kinds of natural phenomenon can we utilize in design and fabrication? How about gravity? So in the, in the foreground of this image, you can see a hanging vine that's in tension. And some of you might recognize this structure. It's actually the top floor of a building that was designed by Anthony Gaudi in Barcelona. And you might be familiar with Gaudi in, in different contexts as a, a artist who did mosaics, as an architect who did these fanciful facades like the one outside the structure, but he also worked as an, as an engineer. And I think his work as an engineer reads very differently from his work as an architect and an artist. And here you can see these really structurally rational arches, which are the inverse of the hanging vine in the background, right? So you have this hanging vine, which is in pure tension. And if you can freeze that form and you can flip it, you get these arches that are in pure compression in the background. And because you're using these funicular forms that are really efficient, you can use minimal amounts of material. And so each of these arches is, if you look, it's essentially you know, a clay tile thick. So the bricks that are used in Barcelona aren't as thick as the bricks that we typically think of in the United States. Maybe they're about half the thickness instead. So quite, quite um, small amounts of material are possible. Now you can extrapolate this idea of hanging forms and flipping them into three dimensions. And this is a technique that was pioneered by the Swiss engineer Heinz Eisler. Here, I'm just showing you a couple variations of this using some computer renderings. Again, we kind of pin and you can pick where you're going to pin it from. You hang it in pure tension and then flip into pure compression. On the right, you can see a series of these models that were developed by Eisler that he created by hanging membranes and then flipping them. And this concept would go on to inform a number of concrete shells like the ones at the, at the left. Super powerful technique. I use this with my students all the time during senior design projects. We're often doing this at the small scale to inform full scale structures, right? We're not doing this to build an actual full scale structure. That would be a little bit crazy, but what if we could? And so this was the premise back in 2011 when two architects approached me for that same City of Dreams design competition that we won with Cast in Place. They wanted to use this jute fiber composite which at the time really hadn't been used all that much. Today, the material has been used a little bit more and they wanted to perform a full scale flip. They wanted to hang the whole structure and then flip it, flip it over. 
Now, when they made their physical models and they hung them, they'd actually interrupted that natural shape that you would expect to form with the floor. And that creates this flat surface here, which is great for putting a band up, right? But not great structurally because it interrupted the efficient form that would be in pure compression. Now you're gonna have high levels of bending in this largely untested material and you're gonna have point loads. So we suggested that maybe we go back into the kitchen and do some more testing. And so here's some other small scale models that they made in their, in their apartment. And you can see again, the hanging model and the inversion. And now they're kind of bringing this thing up off the floor, not interrupting that form that we expect. So if you compare the rendering at the left to the one at the, at the right, we have this revised geometry, we have more curvature, and now we're in pure compression. Now we didn't win the competition and I'm glad we did because we still had no idea how we built this thing, but at least it was this experimental process where we were thinking about how we could improve the structural form. We started doing some research into the materials. It also, you know, got me thinking about how could we perform this large scale flip in the future if we, if we wanted to. So fast forward to 2018, the seven years later, the International Association for Shell and Spatial Structures has a call for a competition to build a pavilion in Barcelona for their 2019 symposium. Now, the team that I worked with was really interested in exploring how to reuse waste, and we focused on reusing plastics. Eventually, we settled on acrylic. Additionally, the competition required that we could only have a couple boxes, and so this essentially required us to have a discretized design. So here you can see the overall concept. We're gonna pin, hang, and then disassemble, and then we're gonna reassemble back in the hanging position, or what we really wanted to do was to flip it into this configuration. So you could leave it hanging in tension or flip it back into pure compression. But acrylic doesn't work like those other models that I showed. You can't just hang it and it's gonna take a form in pure tension. You have to transform it. So let's take a, a look at this video to see how you can do that. Okay, so you could see, right, that we can use heat to transform the material. So what happens is that when you heat the acrylic, it passes through what's called the glass transition temperature. So the material hasn't melted. It's just its material stiffness decreases precipitously. And so it becomes really stretchy and it deflects and forms a curved shape, just like those plaster of Paris models or the hanging, hanging vine. And then when you pull the acrylic, you're able to lock that, that shape in. Others have experimented with this at the small scale, but we wanted to try to make this work at the, at the large scale. We looked at a range of materials. We visited a recycling company to see if PET could work, but eventually we settled on acrylic, which while it's recyclable, it's not often recycled. And also when we heat it and cool it, it retains its transparency. In addition to those small scale prototypes, we submitted a series of renderings like the one that you see here and that video that we that I just showed. 
And we were ex excited to be selected for inclusion in the exhibition and we had to get to work. So here you can see I'm at the left and my colleague Albert Chow's at the right. We're at Plexicraft, which is a furniture manufacturer up in the Bronx in New York City going through scrap at their facility. And they had this whole pile of hot pink acrylic that had been left over from a previous project and it just sat so long that the adhesive was difficult to get off. And at that point they just called it scrap. And so they said, you can have it if you want it. So while we had named this and you saw in the renderings, um, two blue shells with this blue acrylic, we ultimately used hot pink acrylic because well, free material is, is free material. Here we are in a maker space in Brooklyn doing a mock-up at the left. You can see the frame that we're going to hang the structure from. We took those large sheets of acrylic and we used a laser cutter to cut them down to form the tiles at the right. At the bottom left, you can see all the tiles connected together. And at the bottom right, we're doing a test hang. And now at this point, this is all recoverable deformation, right? We're using uh, materials that within a narrow band can be considered you know, close to linear, linear elastic. So when we hang this, we see some deformation, but then when we bring it back to the ground, it will return to its flat state. We still need to transform it. And to do that, we need to find a large scale oven. So here we are in a walk-in oven on Long Island. It's about 30 feet long by eight feet wide by 10 feet tall. And we're bringing the shell in, we're hanging this into in the oven, making some, some adjustments. Maybe a lot of adjustments here. Closing it up. And we've never done anything at this scale. So we're not sure how this is going to go. We're going to open up the oven doors and will this be on the ground of the oven? Hopefully, hopefully not. So we we let it heat up. We let it sit at that temperature. This whole process was probably about 20 to 30 minutes. And now here's the final structure. And we're doing some documentation. And then we're going to pull it out of the, the oven. Here you can see the before and after. At the left, you can see the, the structure. And again, there's some deformation, but it's entirely recoverable. At the right is after we've heated the structure and now it's transformed into that tension only form. What's interesting is that even though we use hot pink acrylic, as you kind of walk around the structure, it looks different. From here, it looks like this fluorescent orange, but then inside the oven looking back out, you can see the pink color. This is probably my favorite photograph from the whole whole project. It's this close up while it's still hanging in the oven and you can see the local curvature that happens. And this is pretty unique, I think, with these shell structures. It's because the structure was discretized, right? We have individual tiles as opposed to being monolithic, but then you also have that combined with the global curvature from the, the shell. We pulled the structure out with many, many hands to support it. We disassembled it. We packed it up and transported it to Barcelona. And there in Barcelona, we teamed up with a group of volunteers called Dubuku. Dubuku works uh, across Spain on trying to educate the public about infrastructure and engineering and architecture. And so I had a contact there and a bunch of volunteers came out and we built. And it was a chaotic day. So this was part of a symposium and there were a number of these pavilions going up all at the same time. So in the background, you're gonna see lots of other structures. And we did the whole installation about 10 hours. For each of the two shells, we reassembled the tiles into halves. So we had kind of half a shell and half a shell that we lifted into place. Here's another view of those shell halves being lifted. And then we connected those to the corner of the posts that would take the loads to the ground. And then we essentially zipped the two halves of each shell together. And here's uh, Lisa Ramsberg again. She worked on cast in place with me and has worked with me on this project as well. Here's a final view in the space. So the two shells were initially supported at different locations in the oven, which led to them having different shapes. So sometimes individuals think that this hanging method basically isn't that interesting because it results in a limited set of forms that you can create. But the reality is that just by playing with the supports, you can get changes in, in height and changes in curvature. So there's still lots of ways that you can influence the design despite the constraints of the, the method. And again, if you look in the background, there's a whole series of these other pavilions that were, were built. Here's another view of the, the structure and now a view from the inside. So it was indoors, so we didn't have the natural lighting, but even with the fluorescent lighting, as you walked around it, you had different impressions. And here you can see that it almost looks like a, a red when you're viewing this from, from below. In this case, the structure was only up for a couple of days for the symposium. We then had to disassemble it and bring it back home. And so we were on a lookout for another opportunity to display the shell. 
And we came across this festival called Cultures Hub ReFest in New York City. And it was intended to feature works by artists and activists and technologists. And the idea was that this structure was supposed to be installed and then people were gonna dance below it. This was all in late March of, of 2020. And you can see we were able to get the structure installed. We actually just installed one in the hanging position as opposed to two inverted to allow people to get below it. And one of the things that was kind of neat here was they set the lighting to kind of project it onto the onto the wall. But March 2020, right? The timing was not great. Um, it was basically the week when shutdowns began in New York City. And so the entire event went, went virtual. And so here's another image of it in the space and they shifted to doing video interviews with some of the designers before everything really completely completely shut down. And so this project really though predates the pandemic and we were thinking about how we could reuse acrylic and plastics. And then during the pandemic, barriers like these that I photographed on Hofstra's campus made from acrylic and polycarbonate just proliferated. And people are really struggling to figure out what to do with all this, all this plastic. Because again, you can recycle it, but the recycling streams just aren't as common because there's not that next use for them that's been developed like there is with things like PET water bottles. So we started to think about other projects that we could maybe use. And this was an unrealized project for a design competition in Buffalo where we proposed a series of benches. And the idea would be that you would take these polycarbonate and acrylic barriers and stack them and get donations from the community and then Let's say that they needed to be redeployed. People could potentially even take them back from the, the pile. Here's another view of that project. So it wasn't um, selected. And that's pretty typical. When we're working on these design competitions, we're going after many of them. And then a couple happen. And that's great. But even on the ones that don't happen, we're trying to use them as intellectual activities or academic activities to try to understand how materials work, how we can transform them, how we can engage with the community, how do we collaborate across different different disciplines. So they're still really valuable even on the projects that you don't you don't secure. This is an, another idea that we were looking at with acrylic. Here we're we're going back to this idea of heat forming the acrylic. The series of renderings shows this idea that we refer to as acrylic pixel. And the idea is that we're going to basically create a modular system of small acrylic panels that we could heat form in the same way as before, but now we don't need to walk in oven. We can do this at a, at a smaller scale. And so the individual panels now are in orientations. They're not structurally ideal, right? They're turned on their sides, but they're so small that we can accommodate this inefficiency to create kind of a more visually compelling piece. And so this was designed for an exhibition that took place in Denmark back in 2022. We had hoped to use those COVID-19 barriers, but a lot of places still were actually hanging on to them. But we ended up receiving a donation of scrap material from Corbell Plastics. At the left, you can see one of these tiles that we laser cut into the form that we wanted. And at the right, there's a short video showing that acrylic tile in a small oven now. In fact, we're at a desktop oven scale. And you can see that while we're heating this, when we pass that glass transition temperature, we have that significant change in in form. At the left is before heating and at the right is after heating. Here's another view hanging in the oven. And now you can see all 15 shells that we're going to use in the installation. Even though we made these in the same oven, we had the same support conditions, they're all slightly different. And this I think is part of the joy of making things by hand is that there's going to be subtle differences that just happen and that you kind of accept that as you complete the project. Everyone has, every piece has its own character. The support structure in this case was really minimal because again, this didn't have to carry any structural loads. It was really an art installation and consisted of a series of threaded rods that cantilevered from a, a plywood base. And then we had these additional acrylic connector plates. The shells were each zip tied to these tiles, to the connector plates to essentially propagate the structure. So here's a view from the, the front and you can get a sense for how the light and the visuals are kind of being distorted by looking through it. And then here's an image as you start to walk behind the structure. And then finally, the view from entirely behind it. And so with so much scrap acrylic and polycarbonate that was produced in my lab has a, a series of 
donations that we've now since received since doing this project that we're looking for other opportunities to utilize, there's going to be chances, there's going to be opportunities for small scale installations. And we've discussed doing ones where we basically now can uh, encircle somebody. And again, this is an art installation for visual, the visual experience, but you could also see this being used for facade elements and others have done this with, with glass, like Herzog and Demuron's Prada building in Tokyo has a series of elements that they formed in this same way to create the, the glass facade. So I think there might be other opportunities for us to use this material for roofs or facade elements. Building on this work, hanging and heating acrylic, we began looking at how we could hang and heat flat grids of 3D printed bioplastics. And specifically, we're looking at the common 3D printed material, polyactic acid or, or PLA. It's right, theoretically biode biodegradable. The lead designer on this project was one of my students, Esther Zhang, and she's allowed me to highlight her project here. So when she was working with me in summer of 2021, and she was looking at some of the acrylic projects, we started talking about ideas for what would become her honors thesis. And we brainstormed essentially two options. The first was to make a series of small models and test out a range of variables. We wanted to look at how we could hang in heat and flip PLA. So we're going to do this kind of slow methodically. Or the second option was, let's just propose a large scale prototype. And then as you're actually trying to make it, figure it out. And that's the option that she chose. And in, in that option, design really leads the way. The experiments aren't always as systematic. They're basically in, in service of making sure the structure stands. Now, this approach is great because you do have all these research questions that come up and you do do testing as you're working toward making that final design. But we also are often leaving a lot of design questions unanswered as we get to the final project. And so that's something where I feel like a lot of these projects have opportunities for us to circle back or to collaborate with others to try to really explore some of the nuances in more detail. Now, here are some of the small scale tests that she performed and she's looking at how we're gonna support this and what's the grid spacing look like. I was initially imagining maybe we would scale this up to something like five feet long. And my only constraints were that I wanted her to 3D print this and then hang and heat it. But she proposed something even more ambitious. She had this idea of creating this arch like structure and you can kind of see what would form the left side of the structure and the right side of the structure that was supposed to be closer to 15 feet, 15 feet long. Now to create something like this, because we don't have a 3D printer that's that big, she was envisioning using a series of smaller panels that would be bolted together. And to do this, she worked with one of her friends, Eugene Chang, who's the founder of a 3D printing company called Tangible Creatives. And what he did was he actually donated all the material and did all the printing on a conveyor belt 3D printer. So the conveyor belt 3D printer prints a small section and then it moves forward and then prints another section. And so in doing this, you're able to print these really long panels. Here you can see one of the test prints that we did in white and then bolt them together to form this larger structure. So we switched from white to black because the white um, showed dirt and wasn't as, as clean. We also eventually had to downsize the dimensions slightly, but you can still see the similarity between this and the drawing that I put up on the screen a, a moment ago. Here we can kind of zoom in and you can see the, the bolted connections up close. Now, the glass transition temperature for PLA is a lot less than acrylic. So we were hopeful we could not have to do this in a walk-in oven. It didn't work out quite that, that way. Um, we ended up going back into the walk-in oven for convenience and because the group color life powder coating concepts let us do it for free. Here it is hanging in the oven. And you can see again, it's pretty flexible. This is all completely recoverable defor deformation. We still need to heat the material to deform it. So we close the oven, we set the temperature to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperature kept rising. It went right past our set point. There must have been some kind of pre-programmed cycle in the oven. And we had done tests in the lab and we knew that we could get up to a little bit above that. So we didn't really worry until we saw it hit 175 degrees Fahrenheit and there was no sign of stopping. So we turned off the oven, we opened the doors and we were met with this. Disaster really, right? Like the piece had slumped so much that it hit the bottom of the frame and the bottom of the oven. So Esther had spent you know six months troubleshooting and we'd gone through all sorts of different scenarios. And now this happened over maybe the course of just a few minutes we had this, but 
After getting over the initial shock of seeing what the piece looked like, we realized that nothing had broken. Everything was still completely intact. Earlier in the year, Esther had conducted a series of experiments in which she explored the potential of reheating to reform PLA structures. And so here's a, a short video showing that process. You can see it's a four corner supported structure and it's being heated. And now we're heating it back to flat. It's a thermoplastic, so you can heat these and then reheat them. And now the supports are at the middle of each edge. So with this in mind, this idea of how you could reheat the structure, we reevaluated the structure in the, in the oven. So what if we just rearrange the supports and heat it again? So my suggestion was, let's just stretch this thing out. But Esther, I think, made the really inspired and, and better decision. Let's just break this large structure up into two smaller ones. And so we rehung this in the, the oven. And while this seemed, again, initially devastating, I look back at the timestamps on the photographs and videos, and we really only, from the time we opened the oven to the time we rehung this and closed it again, it was 20 minutes. So really quick um, thinking because we'd gone through so much troubleshooting before, so much problem solving. In this close up, you can kind of see the kink on one of the structures. This is gonna be one of our visual clues that um, it's gonna be okay when we see that smooth out. And so we um, closed the oven, we checked the settings, we made sure that it didn't creep up above our, our set point. And here it is hanging in the final form. Again, difficult to see the change in shape by looking at it here, but this is the, the after photograph. And then we disassembled, brought it back to campus and reinstalled. And you can see it here. It was exhibited in our on-campus gallery for a few, for a week. And then it was in our on-campus library for a couple months. And this is another view in the, in the space. Prototyping was so critical in this structure. And one other prototype I want to draw your attention to is the one on the left. And this was not made with a, a traditional 3D printer. It was actually made using a 3D printer pen. And a 3D printer pen basically works kind of like a hot glue gun, but instead of extruding hot glue, you're extruding a material like, like PLA. And so we became really interested in the potential of using 3D printer pens to make models. And the idea would be that we're not going to make full-scale structures with these, but could we use these models as a way for students in class and studios to make small scale structures that they can contest? And so we tried this out and I had a student, Lillian Moy, give this a go. And here you can see in this sped up video, Lillian kind of drawing a grid with a 3D printer pen. And then you're gonna see her take it into the oven. And now we're used to this process, right? We're gonna heat and heat it past this glass transition temperature. And at the left, you can see it hanging. At the right, you can see it flipped. And so we're basically now working with a method that you can do in 30 to 45 minutes. So something that you can fit within a standard classroom period and you can make a couple models. And like with anything else, the more you practice with it, the better you get. And so Lillian made a whole series of these. And the ones that I think are the most interesting are the, the one that towards the bottom right, especially the one in the bottom right corner, which is essentially preform. And so to create this structure, what Lillian did, right, you can see her kind of sketching here. So free form in two dimensions, but now when we heat it and hang it, we're going to end up with a structure that is structurally rational in three, three dimensions. And so this is just another way of connecting what, you know, some architects really love this idea of free form design, but then there's the limitations of what that is able to do structurally. So this is trying to have the best of both worlds, the ability to think free form, but then to arrive at something that while still whimsical, has some structural rationale to it. And so one thing that I just wanna conclude on here is this idea that structural efficiency doesn't have to be at odds with aesthetics. Sometimes they're seen as uh, polar opposites, but really they don't have to be. And I think that also with structures, we can include a little bit of, little bit of whimsy. We can have some play within our, our structures. We don't always have to make structures the way that we've made them forever. I know that we're familiar with materials like steel and concrete and brick and wood, and we make so many of our structures out of them. But I hope from what you can take away from today's presentation is that there are other materials out there and there's other ways of, of building. Some will work at a very small scale when you're in a studio and others might be possible at a larger scale. And so, you know, I always just want to encourage individuals that I, I meet and work with just to keep 
being curious and keep prototyping because I think if we can do that, we can develop some really interesting and new structures. So thanks so much for the time today. And again, as I mentioned, all these projects were collaborations with many, many people. Often we got very generous donations. And the two people I really just want to call special attention to would be Rob Cero and Keith McKenzie. They are staff that work in our shop and they're always very supportive of, of all of this. So again, thanks for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have now, or if something comes up later, feel free to email me. Okay, thanks so much.